Transportation Research. I'm a PhD student working with Brian Lindbergh and um, Andrea Parker. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, the work that I've been doing to assess public attitudes towards dam removal and diaphorous fish in the Hudson River watershed. And if you're not familiar, here's the Hudson watershed. It's one of the largest East Coast watersheds, and it has over 90 tributaries that pour into the Hudson. And one of the largest ones is the Mohawk River. And um, it's tidal in between the Federal Dam and down into the New York Harbor. So um, on these tributaries that pour into the main stem of the river, there are many dam systems. This is just one figure that I found. There's many that aren't documented, and also within the watershed itself, there's a lot more. And here's just an image of the progression of dam building. You may have seen this in uh, previous talks. There's also um, a lot of culverts, and the estimate of that is largely unknown. And those also serve as, um, they block um, migratory uh, invertebrates and fish as well throughout the river system. So um, compared to other states in the Northeast, New York is actually very far behind in dam removal, especially in the Hudson, but there's been some really great organizations that are committed to the health um, of this ecosystem and uh, river keepers are doing a really great job. If you were here this morning, you saw the plenary uh, video that gave a nice little warm up to what I've been doing for my dissertation work. Um, so John Lipscomb in that video um, described this dam removal and how it happened. And this is actually one of our study sites that we've been going out to and talking to stakeholders. And um, in the media, this got picked up a lot and people were talking about river hearing. They're these charismatic fish that are able to come back into this tributary and spawn for the first time in 85 years. So maybe we can use this migratory fish as a hook to help uh, manage connectivity in the watershed. So just a little brief overview of diatomous fishes in the Hudson River watershed. We um, have some familiar faces. Our smell, unfortunately, aren't around anymore. For the purposes of this study, I'm focusing on um, river herring and American eel. These fish are very resilient when there's dam removals. They really colonize those tributaries immediately and they love to get into those trips and get that spawning habitat. So um, diatomous fishes have had a long history of being important for coastal and river communities as um, food resources as well as for commercial um, and cultural values. And we have seen along the east coast of the U.S. Uh, precipitous decline, um, extremely low biomasses. And um, so these are for the alewife and blueback herring, known as river herring, and the American eel. So one of the major population drivers um, contributing to these declines is dams, the presence of them on these tributaries, these great habitats, and the loss of that habitat. <coughs> But there are also other factors that play into this as well as overharvest, pollution, and bycatch. So the goals of my um, dissertation, the first part, is to look at the public perception of dam removal and these diatomous fishes themselves um, within the Hudson River. And we chose um, two communities to start with now. And then we'd like to expand that effort into the Mohawk later this year. And um, one way in order to think about um, these complicated environmental issues is to approach it using systems thinking. And there's many different um, engagement strategies that can be used like participatory mapping and modeling to help sort of elicit some of the complexity out of these environmental issues. And so I used a, a series of interventions to try and get at this question and test the hypothesis that we can um, increase the receptivity if there's a little bit less uncertainty for stakeholders. So I am grounding this work in the field of social ecological systems. So um, when we're talking about dam removal and increasing access to habitat, we're thinking about these coupled natural and human systems. Humans put these dams and these barriers on these river systems and the fish want to be able to use that habitat. So this is happening across scales and there's interactions and causal pathways that are at play and we need to understand those interactions better. And one way that I'm doing this is thinking about resilience and doing a resilience approach. And this has been mentioned in the past by John, 
um, it's a great way to try and build the capacity for thinking about our ecosystem services and the benefits that humans derive from these natural resources. And in order to do that, I'm looking at different principles that have been created to look at how ecosystem services can be resilient, so how they can persist in um, response to environmental change, we know that's going to keep happening, and if restoration activity keeps happening, our ecosystem services presently from our diatomous fishes is going to change. So one way in order to do that is to look at governance systems and also just the key properties of that social ecological system itself. So what I'm going to focus on today is looking at participation and also thinking about complex adaptive systems. So this is an extension of systems thinking. I know I have a really horrendous network graph up here, but this just shows the complexity. There's social, biophysical, and ecological factors that are at play, and there's different um, pathways that are and interactions happening between them. And but in the middle, we have to think about our ecosystem services, our human and ecological well-being. And this has salmon up there. I'm changing it to river herring. Um, so. In order to get at this human well-being point, we need to understand what people are thinking about diatomous fish and dam removal on the ground in the Hudson and start with the baseline. Come up with some attitudes. Maybe we can come up with ecosystem service valuations from that afterwards. So this is just the first step in a larger process. So in order to look at public um, attitudes and receptivity to dam removal and um, diatomous fishes themselves, I'm using tools from the social sciences and trying to be a boundary spanner. So I'm pulling from environmental communication theory, and one of them is when we have a complex environmental issue, we um, talk about it in public discourse um, <coughs> by a certain number of frames. And these are some pretty broad frames in which uh, this is talked about, and there's also resonance that occurs in between the frames as well, so you don't talk about one in isolation. However, these are really broad and they can be further refined in thinking about dam removal specifically as a technology. And there's this speed framework that looks at the integration of these technologies. This has been applied to um, thinking about renewable energy resources and there's a lot of literature on that. And these are some frames in which you can bin public discourse into. So I further modified this to think about fisheries management in this dam removal case scenario and I came up with coding categories from that to where I could take focus group survey data, rich qualitative text, and bin it into categories and then enumerate that by are we speaking about this topic as a risk and uncertainty or as a benefit and try and get at that stalemate that we're having here in the Hudson River watershed. So um, from the uh, video earlier, if you heard in the plenary, the sampling sites that we are using are the ones that were shown in the video, which was really great. But I just wanted to point out that the Quasay Creek is one of the citizen science um, monitoring program stations that Sarah will be talking about later. So I'll breeze over that a bit. So for the first part of my work, um, I'm looking at participation and how to um, increase um, access to knowledge and do more than address the knowledge deficit gap. So this goes from simple one-way communication of knowledge to more participatory processes. So we started off with doing a lecture and a field trip activity. This was public engagement and we did surveys and focus groups from this. We centered it around dam removal but really focused on let's talk about dam removal in terms of fish restoration. And then we thought about these complex adaptive systems and I came up with a systems model and I had stakeholders <coughs> look that over and try and have some discourse with that and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So here's an example of one of our lectures that we had in this like really awesome museum. It was cool to be surrounded by the history and then we walked right outside and we were able to electroshock for eels and river herring um, right in the mouth of the Winans Kill where the dam was removed previously. And here's um, the next intervention that I did. So this is supposed to be a very collaborative process. It's called mediated modeling. Um, stakeholders are able to explore um, a systems model that I came up with. Again, I parameterized it to the best of my ability, but it 
the goal here is not about the model itself, it's how people are interacting and talking through these complicated processes and how they um, interact with each other. So it had a nice little interface that they could click through and pull graphs up with. And here's a nice little image, Scott is in here, <laughs> critiquing my model. But I recorded all this and then coded that into those, um, those categories that I came up with before. So this is standard social science methods. I'm going to have quotes in front of their slides. There's a lot of text. I think you can handle it. So um, here is um, a snapshot of some survey responses between our communities. So I know this text is really small and I don't want you to see that. I just This is showing uh, the knowledge that um, stakeholders had prior to coming to our workshops. So just looking at the colors, we had people in one group that had more knowledge about fish and then others they had more knowledge about river processes and um, flood resiliency and things like that. So we were getting at different stakeholders from different sites, which was good. And then here comes the focus group. So we have uh, both of our communities on the x-axis here. We have all the frames and how they chose to talk about them, whether it was in a positive or a negative. And on the y-axis, you have the percent by which the conversation was made up by that. So I know there's a lot going on here, but I want you to focus on the bottom orange, ecological. Stakeholders came to this meeting to talk about fish restoration and dam removal as a way to do that. We were not talking about the ecology very much. We were talking about all these other issues that are, are important, yes, but not why we're here. Not the primary benefit of uh, dam removal from what, how we approach the workshop. Um, however, um, those that did talk about the ecology really expressed how many people don't realize that the river is alive and, you know, citizen science programs that bring people to the river to see the eels, like we heard from Chris Bowser, um, are really great in sort of fostering this linkage. And we had a dam, dam owner, so he's a private dam owner, he came to one of our events and he brought all these really cool pictures of his dam and he took this video of eels trying to get off the wall right below his dam. And he's really interested in moving the dam. However, he really likes to visit it at the same time. And he wants to make sure that he can't put any micro hydropower on there. So he's kind of at like a standstill with his dam. Um, so we weren't really talking about fisheries restoration. And if we were, it, we had people say, you start realizing what was here, you try to visualize what was here 200 years ago. So this is an example of shifting baselines, <coughs> ecological amnesia, and we've seen this in the literature with other environmental issues like this. But I do like this quote down here, a fish run that has been going on for a couple thousand years is more historic, mm -hmm. and people are getting hung up with the idea of this mill pond and how quaint it is. And, focusing on that history, which is valid, and its social cultural value. However, if we want to restore our fish populations, maybe that has to come out. And here's um, another quote that kind of encapsulated this dichotomy between having this history and this value there, and like maybe making an <coughs> urban creek walkway, and at the same time making sure the fish are able to access the habitat that they need. So here's a similar graph. This was our mediated modeling workshop. So we had a lot of technical stakeholders come up. And I want to put this up here because there were a lot of risks and uncertainties from a more technical audience that came and spoke, talking about the focus groups. But again, we see the same pattern where we're not really talking about the ecology that could be benefited by dam removal. So, um, and again, one of the things that came up at this last meeting was a lot of stories of failed dam removal efforts and how there's not really a good track right now to um, remove dams and there's not a series of success stories and hopefully Riverkeeper is going to help with that in the coming years get that going so you don't, don't have to do this. So um, some take home points, we had um, resonance occurring between social systems, people were talking about all these other things except <coughs> our Diagnosis fish restoration. So that's called goal migration. That's been seen in the environmental communication literature. 
And um, one thing that was really missing from this work was talking to private dam owners themselves. And I have another um, part of my dissertation in which I want to go out and do semi-structured interviews with dam owners and try to get more of that voice um, coming into this. And so the next part of my dissertation, um, some questions came up. We have these technical challenges in New York. Can we look to other states to help make these processes more efficient? And I'm actually interested in can we look at other managing institutions and how they manage for uncertainty and surprise? We have climate change coming up with precipitation increasing that's going to blow out a lot of these structures. What do other states do and can we just sort of adapt to that? I don't know. So um, one way to try to figure that out is to do like a program evaluation survey um, along east and west coast states and see how they approach dam removal. I'm trying to only focus on dams that are currently not serving any purpose, not getting into the hydropower work. And then another question that I have is, people weren't talking about fish. They do not understand the ecosystem services that were there, and it's not their fault. So how can we sort of value what ecosystem services there are currently for badgerous fish and what they could look like? And one way to do that is to do some social, cultural, ecosystem service valuation methods. And these are some social, cultural, ecosystem services that um, you may not be aware of that do exist. And maybe we can identify them for each of these communities and sort of um, evaluate it that way. But one way to do that is I'm thinking of doing a focus group that's very deliberative, where there's different metrics where you can choose. And then that can correspond to different management applications. And we can put dollar values and things like that on there. But I know there's another talk on this later, though. So with that, um, I'd like to take any questions and definitely thank everyone that's helped me. This is not an exhaustive list. Thank you.